On Monday, the GMO debate returned to the Hawaii County Council Chamber. It's a continuation of a discussion that's been ongoing at the Public Safety and Mass Transit Committee. Two bills proposing to regulate GMOs in different ways have been whittled down to focus on just one bill. There was a large crowd at the council chamber in Hilo, but nothing like what we've seen in the past when it comes to this topic. Early in the discussion, Brenda Ford tried to breathe new life into her bill, which got a negative recommendation at the last committee um, meeting. So we voted it down, so I don't see that there's any reason why we would be referring it when we voted it down. Pursuant to county code, um, that's that, that was wrong, what we did. Ford's Bill 109 would have made it illegal to grow GMOs on the island, including the transgenic papaya, which has become so prevalent in Pune. County code dictates that a bill proposing the Department of Environmental Management enforce a law must be sent to that department for review before a vote. That means last week's vote could have violated the county code. The rule was debated. I know that you can vote this down and not send it over there, but that's an inappropriate move, and I would hope that um, each of you would consider what your constituents have been saying. 90% uh, of them are, are saying that they want GMO to be banned. The approach of this um, council was to not pursue 109. So I, I just think it again starts to getting things confused. I don't think it's a matter of not listening to the constituents. We need to get something done. The committee ultimately voted to reconsider the bill and send it to environmental management. That means Ford's bill is still alive in committee. The elected officials then discussed a forum held in Waikoloa about GMOs. Council members who attended had to report their attendance for sunshine purposes. So um, we did check before we all three attended, and um, conferences, um, it, it's a legal thing for us to attend. We just needed to put this communication forward and report on our attendance. So um, just briefly, um, the summit was held in Kona, and um, I was interested in attending because I wanted to hear as much as I c could about GMO and there were several scientists there um, that promoted um, the science of GMO and there were several who um, expressed concerns and although it wasn't um, open to the public, I think the public could attend, but it was, no, it was more for the, um, it was held by the um, Leeward Planning Conference and the um, Hawaii Economic Development Council. It was not open to the public. In fact, I did not get an invitation at first. They said they couldn't, unable to contact me. Um, and that it was very lopsided. Out of seven presenters or speakers, there was uh, really only one, uh, Hector Valenzuela, who um, was specifically addressing the concerns about this. Um, there was, uh, the others that were brought in were brought in by the Hawaii Crop and Improvement Association, which is the biotech industry's advocacy arm. Um, when they were asked, most of those testifying were talking about how they were um, independent, yet when they were asked who paid for their way, it was that that um, biotech advocacy group was bringing them in. Um, and in fact, at first, it wasn't uh, even Hector Valenzuela was not uh, being covered by them. So it was just very lopsided. It was they brought in all of the business people around the county and got a uh, completely. Uh, it was not something where anyone could speak or present different points of view. There was um, also uh, Kwana Beamer, who's um, uh, pretty much took did not at initially take a strong position either way, but then when it just became so slanted, he stood up and said, I can't take this anymore and left. We attended and sure, it was a little lopsided. The morning discussion was, was uh, a good discussion. You know, there was, there was a lot of different viewpoints and I thought it helped me tremendously. And After that, the committee could focus on Willie's Bill 113. Just to, let's just draw the line in the sand where we are right now and then go on and look at at some of the more 
questions after that. And that second approach is the way I've done it, which is basically to grandfather in, number one, the papaya as an industry. It's already, it's everywhere. It's um, impractical to just say no at this point. The day was devoted to an all-star list of expert witnesses, recognizable faces in the GMO debate, both for and against, farmers, scientists, and doctors. But first, a politician. And on Kauai, we're, we're dealing with a similar but much more advanced situation. Kauai Councilman uh, Gary Hooser, who is leading a high-profile charge on Kauai to curtail the effects of GMO agricultural practices on his island. Hooser's Bill 2491 has inspired huge marches and deep passions. Hawaii County picked his brain for a while on Monday. Uh, the companies are doing a lot of testing, experimenting, and growing uh, of genetically modified organisms. They are on about 13,000 acres. They dominate the west side and moving to the south side and the east sides of, of our community. And uh, the community is very concerned. They're concerned about their health. Uh, you mentioned, I think, an OBYGN here as a resource. We have doctors, physicians in, the, in all around our community who believe uh, strongly that the people who live in these districts are have a greater incidence of certain illnesses and ailments, in, in, including certain kinds of cancer and birth defects in newborns. And it's, it's scary, quite frankly. Uh, you know, I've spoken to the industry, uh, trying to find out what they're doing. Secrecy is a big uh, problem. They won't tell the council what they're doing. They won't tell me what they're doing. Uh, they're spraying and applying an enormous number of pesticides, uh, restricted use pesticides, that no other farmers on Kauai uh, use. I was wondering, is the federal government or the state government or also is the, your county, is there any provisions that would regulate the testing? Uh, the, the, the federal government tells the state basically how to regulate. So the state isn't, isn't so much pointing to the federal government. It's, it's more the other people in the council and the community pointing to the state and the federal. Do your job. The, the, the industry will point to the Department of Agriculture and they'll say, well, we're, we're regulated, we're highly regulated. We have, to, we have regular inspections from the Department of Agriculture. Okay, I got copies of the inspection logs. 43% of those inspections are redacted. They're blank because of enforcement violations. Uh, it takes up to three years, the Department of Ag told us, to resolve a complaint of pesticide uh, uh, misuse or applications. You know, we've had schools where kids went to the hospital sick thinking, and most people believing it was pesticides coming from the GMO fields. It took up to six years for the Department of Ag to do an investigation. So we as a, as a local community are doing similarly as what you're doing. We're saying, okay, we're not going to wait. We want to pass an ordinance to stop everything. Well, and today we're struggling a little bit with the difference between open air cultivation and open air testing. And um, can we make a distinction there? Uh, our focus has been on pr the prohibition of experimental testing. And uh, the experimental is defined in our bill. I don't have the, the, at the top of my tongue, but it's the industry will talk about reg uh, deregulated crops and regulated crops. Uh, an experimental in our bill is defined as an organism, a genetically modified organism that has not been approved for release into the general environment nor approved for human consumption. You know, we believe it's reasonable to require those types of things to be done indoors. From there, the day was like another hearing, but instead of the public expressing its opinion, the testimony came from speakers chosen by the council members. Speakers like UH plant pathologist Michael Shintaku, who along with others downplayed the health concerns the anti-GMO groups associate with Roundup the Monsanto herbicide. Some GMO crops have been created to be Roundup ready, which means use of the weed killer would not affect those crops. And glyphosate, Roundup, is, is, is the, you know, compared to most things, quite benign. You might want to, like, I've had this conversation with people before, with ban Roundup. You might want to ban Roundup, but the next few herbicides down the list, you know, that people will turn to are worse than Roundup. That's what I think. And you know, I, I, you know, personally, I use Roundup at home. I would not like to ma have to manage weeds without Roundup or any of these other pesticides. Okay. Anyway, that's my feeling. And well, R Roundup is, what Roundup does is it um, interferes with a, a pathway that plants have. 
So, so that's why it takes a long time for plants to die. You can spray it, 10 days later, you finally see some, something happening, right? Because the plants have this, so what, what it does is it interferes with uh, phenylalanine biosynthesis, I think. We don't have that, the humans, and so, so it's, it's quite non-toxic. On the other side, an OBGYN doctor who insisted the health effects of GMO food consumption have been proven and documented. 35 diseases that have, gone, that have skyrocketed with the increase in the use of glyphosate and GMO foods. And I'm sorry, this is so emotional because we are talking about the babies and our food and the whole future of our island. When you mess with the, these pathways, you take glyphosate in you. It depletes your aromatic amino acids, your methionine, and your cytochrome P450. When you mess with cytochrome P450, you don't make vitamin D anymore. You don't make your cholesterol right anymore. You don't get, make your bile acid right for your gallbladder digestion. You don't stabilize your blood so you can, be on, you can bleed too much or you can make a clot for a stroke. I kept wondering, why is everybody being low in vitamin D in this incredible climate that we have? Right. Whether or not they're using sunscreen or going outside. It's because now I, I saw this at 10 o'clock last night listening to Dr. Seneff's presentation. You can go to two places. You can listen to Dr. Don Huber, who's been in the military bioterrorism and microbial ecology for 40 years, and you can go to Dr. Seneff's 40-page work or her lecture on Kauai, and you can learn more than you want to know about how scary the GMO foods and the glyphosates are. This little, here's a page of how fast it affects a placental cell, 18 hours at 100 times less the amount than we're currently allowed to use on our people, on our plants. Here's a study in Canada where all the canola is 100% GMO now. The studies found the byproducts of glyphosate in the pregnant women and in their fetuses. And there's finally a study out that shows, yes, this protein, you give that plant AIDS, you give them this protein, you inject it into their DNA, you give them AIDS, yes, it's traveling through our guts, our ruined, leaky guts, and into our bodies. There is horizontal transfer. We are being colonized with these proteins. We've had this experiment once with HIV. Do we want to do this again? Also, Dr. Hector Valenzuela, the professor at UH, well regarded for his GMO analysis. We haven't conducted a single study to determine the independent study to determine the economics, the environmental, or the safety of the health safety of, of GMO papaya. Uh, so we haven't been able to go back and, tr and trace what are the actual impacts on, 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 on the state. Uh, secondly, in terms of the eco economics, uh, about 40% of the farmers went out of business. Uh, the volume of production is about 30% from the high levels of papaya production in the, in the old days in Hawaii. Uh, and the, the value of the crop uh, is in general lower than the non-GMO conventional or organic papaya. Uh, in, in my breeding classes, one of the main rules was that when you develop a new variety, it has to be a superior variety. It cannot be inferior to standard varieties. And if the consumer is not willing to pay more than the, what they do for the conventional papaya, then in my perspective, it's not what we should be looking for. Okay. From what I'm hearing, it, these are all economic um, faults. This is not even a health reason. And we're here for public safety. And on well, it went. No decision making that, and very um, little discussion from the council. The debate continues on October 1st during the regularly scheduled committee meeting.